Cal, welcome. Thank you for bringing California to our stage. Like uh, it. Well, <laughs> yeah. The, so I've lived in, in California for a little while now, and one of the things you forget about is that the, uh, the rest of the world has weather. Like, there are seasons, and sometimes it's nice, and sometimes it's cold. But luckily, it's a really nice day for London today. Oh, I don't really remember the weather being like this when no, I was still here. No, it's always like this, Cal, honestly. Oh, OK. Well, it's been... A, it's a great development. I'm super happy. Great. Well, thank you for being here. Um, just out of interest, could, could people raise their hand? Who uses Slack in, in this room? Oh, wow. OK. okay. Yeah. So we've got, we got a bunch of pretty kind of uh, sophisticated digital uh, people who, who are using your tool to collaborate. So uh, let's, let's get into it. Um, so obviously, innovation is happening at a really incredible pace at the moment. But are we more productive than we used to be? Or is that something that's still up for debate? I think, it, I think it's a great question. And when you look at the role technology plays in the workplace, over the last couple of decades, there's been really big advances in personal individual productivity. And the technology use cases have been really focused on what is it uh, people do every day in their particular roles. And that's across all kinds of roles, all kinds of industries. But it's very much about personal productivity. And I think what we haven't really seen change at all over the last 20 years has been team productivity and the productivity of people working together. And I think increasingly, as uh, more, of, more of the world shifts towards knowledge work, kind of all knowledge work is teamwork. And so eventually, all work becomes teamwork. And what we haven't really seen addressed before is the productivity of teams together. And I think that's the real sweet spot for Slack, is how can we make teams of people more productive when they work together. So you're talking, I mean, it was interesting hearing uh, Vernon Vogel's talk this morning about kind of like the, the you know, 10 to 12 people in a team. Is, is that kind of the sweet spot for you as well, those kind of two pizza teams? Yeah, I really like the, the, the pizza team term that they use at Amazon. And I think that something that we didn't realize when we first built the product was um, we, we were thinking about small teams like ourselves. So the, the Slack product comes from, we're, we're trying to make video games. Um, and that didn't work out. Um, but the Slack, the product, came from the tools we built while working together to make games. And we were split between uh, San Francisco in the US and Vancouver in Canada. And we built this set of tools to enable us to collaborate and work together well. And we thought when we were building the product, well, we know how small teams work, and it will work well for small teams. Um, but the thing that we didn't realize, which we should have realized, is that in a large company, if you have 100,000 employees, they don't all work together with each other. Any large company is still made up of these small teams. And so I think that regardless of whether you're you know, like a, a two or three person family business um, through kind of any industry, through to the largest companies in the world, all of the work that happens works on small teams. And so making those teams more efficient, more collaborative, um, is hugely powerful for any organization. And what's getting in the way of those teams becoming more productive? Like, how, how can Slack kind of uh, ensure that they're getting more done and they're less distracted than they maybe were in the past? I think the thing that really holds back productivity of teams and so productivity of companies is communication. Like, okay. in any growing organization, the biggest barrier to increased efficiency is sharing of information and communication. And on the one hand, I think using Slack inside your organization can help that by increasing transparency. You know, it moves from the kind of at the core of Slack is the channels model. The idea that instead of communication being one to one by default, which is the kind of like email default, communication goes into a channel, which is, you know, organized around a topic or a team or an area of work. So that communication can be seen by everybody who needs to be involved. And so I think increasing that level of transparency can be hugely helpful. But kind of on the other side, um, as I said earlier, with the increase in personal productivity, this has happened because there is more and more software being used in the workplace today. A company today is using many, many more software vendors than it did five or 10 years ago. In the case of any medium-sized company today, they're buying software from maybe 100 different vendors or more. And these bits of software make our individual jobs much better. You know, they're aimed at uh, marketing automation or sales automation or all of the kind of myriad of developer tools you have, all these tools that make individual roles much more productive. But Tying all of those together on a platform like Slack helps make the team more productive, brings all of those kind of elements of work into one place for people to work on them together. So in terms of that kind of collaborative um, energy that you're bringing to, to the workplace, um, is the key to it, as far as you're concerned, the fact that you have so many other third parties plugging in via an API? Is that what really the kind of like the, the, the secret source is, do you think? Or? I think that it's definitely part of the, the secret source, is that 
nobody that kind of does their work uh, on an island, whether that's doing their work without other people or doing their work without other pieces of software. And there are all of these places now where kind of where individual bits of work happen. And tying those all together is something that's been really powerful for us. Um, I think the the other kind of the, the big trend that's happened in the workplace is, or kind of for business in general, is that there's uh, an increasing amount of change in the world that companies need to respond to, whether that's external change, that markets move faster than ever, technology is evolving faster than ever, and organizations have to be able to adapt to that. But there's internal change as well. Um, within a year, more than 50% of the workforce will be millennials. And that's going to be a huge change in what that means to work in general. Um, and driven a lot by kind of the rise of um, mobile apps in people's personal lives, people have a much higher kind of quality expectation of the software that they use in the workplace. People are, I mean, a lot of the success of Slack is driven by the move to messaging in the personal space. People are using Facebook Messenger or iMessage or WhatsApp. You don't email your friends anymore to organize going out in an evening. You know, you use a messaging app. And that expectation of that kind of quality of experience is being brought into the workplace. And people want tools in the workplace that, uh, that meet a much higher kind of bar of quality and of polish and of experience. People are expecting, have different expectations now in the workplace than, than even five years ago. And is, do you think that it's, it's fair to say that um, although Slack is, I mean, I, I don't know if, whether you describe it as an enterprise tool or not, but it, it certainly feels like a consumer product when you use it rather than something that, oh, I'm switching on my computer, I'm at work now. I, I think that's, that's definitely true. We didn't set out really to build enterprise software. And I think the, the term enterprise software is not like an exciting or sexy term. Yeah, exactly. And when people think about enterprise software, they might think like whatever it is your company uses for expense reporting. And the experience <laughs> of using that is not a joyful experience. It is a tortuous experience. And you, you don't think, yes, I get to file expenses today. What an amazing, <laughs> like, visceral experience I'm going to have. It's horrible. Nobody likes doing that. Um, and I think part of that is that enterprise software on the whole, like historically, has been built to sell to the CIO or to you know, sell to the procurement department or the C-suite. Um, and because we didn't really set out to build a bit of enterprise software, we, built, we set out to, to solve a problem that we had. You know, we, we very much had this communication problem. We were the first customers. We kind of knew our needs. And we really focused on just fixing the, the need that we had. And that focus on the experience of the end user makes a very different kind of product. You know, we make, a, in theory, a bit of enterprise software, but one that people love to use and have a, like a joyful experience with. And I think that has, it really is just because we focus endlessly on the user experience and what it's like to use it. Because if you're a successful organization using Slack, you're in Slack all the time. It's the center of where your work happens. And so we need that to be a good experience to, for you to want to actually come back and find it useful every day. Yeah, so you used the word joyful about a piece of software that you know, we use at work, which is, which is a really interesting thing because you've got 8 million daily active, active users, but the actual kind of time spent on Slack by most of those users is incredible. I can't remember the number, it's like five hours or something a day, something, something like that. Um, how do you create a, create a product, I guess any product, with that level of, of stickiness? Like, what, what are you doing when you're designing? I think. I think probably if you set out to make something really sticky, you're going to find that very difficult. Okay. I think that like, if that's the thing you have in mind, you want to create something that people will find sticky. Like, if you think about it in those terms, I think that's tough. If you think about it in terms of, can, do I understand the problems that customers have, what their needs are, and can I solve those in such a way that I can solve it and get out of the way? You know, we don't, we don't think about designing Slack as like, how could we have people use it for more hours every day? <laughs> like, that, that's definitely not, yeah. people aren't looking for something to fill their time with in the workplace. Or if they are, it shouldn't be their, their business software. Um, so we really understand the problem and solve that problem as quickly as possible. A really great software experience is one where you forget you're using that thing, where it's just kind of transparent in the background, enabling the, the actual work that you need to get done. Okay, so you've, you've worked with a lot of third parties in order to optimize the product. What, what have you learned from, from users in terms of how they want to work and, and how they can best optimize their time? What do you hear from people? We, we spend a lot of time talking to customers and understanding their needs. And I think it's 
one of the more interesting things is that customers across all different industries, all different roles, all different sizes of customers, you know, we have customers in kind of every space from small retailers uh, or like estate agents or wildlife parks through to the largest kind of multinational Fortune 100 companies. And they all have very similar needs at the team level, which is that they need to feel connected to their team. They need to understand what's going on. They need to their communication to be tied into the tools that they use. Some of those tools are very industry specific, you know, especially like healthcare or finance or mining and minerals. And many of those tools are universal, regardless of the organization, regardless of their role. Things like Google Docs and Dropbox and Salesforce that kind of are fairly ubiquitous. And so kind of understanding the tool set that's really important to each customer and what that workflow looks like and taking those tools that they have to use to get their work done and making them a little bit better by using them with Slack, I think is hugely powerful. So around, I'd say, 80% of people in this room raised their hand when we asked who uses Slack. It's clearly, it's an incredibly uh, uh, powerful tool for, for people who are kind of, certainly I would say maybe not early adopters because you're not at that stage yet, but certainly people maybe who are working in digital kind of businesses, certainly younger people, I'd suggest. Um, how do you think you're going to kind of get to, the, to that next level because clearly there's a lot of people love the product, a lot of people using it, but if you, know, you speak to a lot of people, there's still maybe not that, that level of awareness. So today, more than 60% of our users are outside of technical roles. So we already have a, a, a fairly kind of distributed user base in all kinds of different roles and industries. Um, but at the same time, uh, you said we have... Uh, we announced we had 8 million daily active users. And really, daily active users is the measure we use for our growth. Because if you're using Slack successfully, you're using Slack every single day. And so that's the, the kind of one measure that we look at for kind of health of the business and growth. Um, however, our kind of total you know, uh, possible user base is knowledge workers. And today, that's somewhere north of 600 million people. So we're really just kind of scratching the surface of that. We're barely at 1%. Um, of, where, of where we could go. And I think it's, um, the, it's, a, it's a new software category, so part of it is uh, letting people know that there is this different way of working which they might find more valuable or they, they would find makes their organization more efficient or makes working, make them feel closer to the mission of their team or their company. Um, so part of it is just like telling people that this is a thing that exists now and you can try it. The other side is that as I said, there's this real increasing proliferation of software categories that people are using, and we need Slack to be able to work with all of those to make it, make, uh, make it work for more and more use cases and more and more industries. And how do you compete with other larger entrenched incumbents in, in that kind of productivity space? So we, um, you know, we have a, a real kind of viable competitor in the, in, the, in the shape of Microsoft now, and I think that's, that's been very good for us in a few ways. One is that when, when we started the company, when we started building the product, we had a belief that like, this was a new product category that people would want to use, and that uh, you know, we believe that most team communication will happen in channels in the next decade. You know, we have a firm belief that this is the right thing, that people are going to want to use this. But believing it yourself when you're a startup is one thing. You know, plenty of people at startups believe in crazy things that never come true. Um, it's definitely very validating that uh, a player as big as Microsoft, you know, the biggest, the biggest company in the enterprise software space, believes that enough that they want to make a product just like ours in exactly the same space. So it's, it's very validating that it's not just us who have this crazy belief now, it's the wider market. So, Products like Slack will exist a decade from now and will be a serious thing that people use. Um, but aside from just validating that this is a real software category that people should use, um, it's healthy to have competition, to have a kind of innovation in the space pushing it forward. So I think it's really good for us that, uh, that we have competitors like Microsoft. So I'm very keen that you say something crazy that startup people might, might say. Um, is, are we going we, we to uh, see the end of email, do you think, in the next sort of like... 10, 20 years? I mean, email is like the cockroach of the internet. It's like nobody <laughs> likes it, but they're impossible to eradicate. And I don't think email is going to go anywhere. People's business cards still have uh, fax numbers on them, and fax was never super relevant. Um, email isn't going to go away, but I think what we will see is a reduction in use cases. Um, so, you know, we're, where we see lots of with our successful customers, we see a lot of communication that used to happen over email moves into Slack. We'll start to see more and more individual use cases where email takes a back seat and email is like more, less and less used. But still, 
decades from now, like the robots have taken over, killed all of us, they will still send each other email. They will still hate it, <laughs> but it will just be impossible to replace. <laughs> Um, okay, that's, that's good news. You certainly did uh, live up to your promise. Um, you raised 427 million in August, 250 million from SoftBank last year. How are you going to use this, these, these vast sums of money? Um, I think really we're, we're focused on where it is we can accelerate our business and to kind of just give us all of the options in the future for growth. You know, we're really concentrated on the, the future growth of the business and reaching a wider audience and, and having more and more people in more and more industries use Slack. Great. Well, robots maybe too, if they're not emailing each other after the... Exactly, uh, yeah. Great. Cal, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you.